The Second Amendment has always been one of the most hotly debated subjects in American politics. And it's not hard to see why. When a conservative looks at the amendment, they tend to focus in on this. Whereas when a liberal looks at the amendment, all they tend to see is this. And issues surrounding gun rights have seemed to grow uglier and uglier in recent history. After a mass shooting, the leader of the NRA said this. The only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. While white gun rights activists conducted open carry protests and Clive and Bundy and his supporters threatened to shoot federal agents if they attempted to stop him from allowing his cattle to illegally graze on government land, a number of young black people have been killed by police for merely holding guns or objects that resemble them. In perhaps the most outrageous incident of all, a child named Tamir Rice was killed by police without any warning or hesitation for the crime of of holding a toy gun in a park in an open carry state. Those officers, by the way, went completely unpunished. And yet, as ugly as this vast racial inequity is, as ugly as Second Amendment debates get, as ugly as calls for Second Amendment solutions by right-wing radicals are. You know, I'm hoping that we're not getting to Second Amendment remedies. I hope the vote will be the cure for the Harry Reid problems. The historical origins of the Second Amendment might be uglier still. And if you're wondering, could it really be that bad? Prepare to be a little horrified. Before I address the circumstances surrounding the adoption of the amendment, I should first talk very briefly about perhaps the biggest question surrounding the Second Amendment, which is whether the right to bear arms is an individual right or a collective right. This debate seems to me built right into the wording of the amendment. The fact that it says the right of the people makes it seem like a right that applies to individuals while the clause, being necessary for the security of a free state, makes it seem like a collective right belonging to states. Supreme Court precedent has held the right to be an individual right since the 2008 decision in the case of the District of Columbia versus Heller. That decision overturned 70 years of precedent established by the United States versus Miller in 1939, which held that the framers included the Second Amendment to ensure the effectiveness of the military. But in reality, while the origins of the Second Amendment have little to do with the rights of individual people to have guns for private use, they also have very little to do with the military, if by that we mean the federal armed forces. In fact, the US did not even officially establish a large standing army until the outbreak of World War II. When the Constitution was written, national security was ensured by the federal government's right to raise, discipline, and arm a temporary militia. But even these federal militias were not what the Second Amendment refers to. The militias that are necessary to the security of a free state are of course state militias. And the right of states to raise, discipline, and arm their own militias was granted in the amendment in response to Article 1, Section 8 of the proposed Constitution, which only granted the federal Congress that right. But if Congress has the exclusive right to raise a militia, what would happen in the event of a slave revolt in the South? Could Southern slave owners count on the North-controlled federal government to help them protect their right to own slaves? Well, that's exactly what slaveholders and slave advocates were concerned about when the Second Amendment was drafted. As Patrick Henry put it, if the country be invaded, a state may go to war, but cannot suppress slave insurrections. If there should happen an insurrection of slaves, the country cannot be said to be invaded they cannot therefore suppress it without the interposition of Congress. George Mason was similarly worried that the Congress would refuse to allow states to raise militias to protect the institution of slavery. Congress may neglect to provide for arming and disciplining the militia, and the state governments cannot do it, for Congress has an exclusive right to arm them. Patrick Henry also feared that Congress would use its exclusive right to raise militias to abolish slavery directly, in a process called manumission. In fact, his fears were quite justified as Abraham Lincoln did just that. They will search that paper and see if they have power of manumission, Henry said. Have they not, sir? Have they not power to provide for the general defense and welfare? May they not think that these call for the abolition of slavery? May they not pronounce all slaves free? And will they not be warranted by that power? They have the power in clear, unequivocal terms and will clearly and certainly exercise it. 
For his first draft of what became the Second Amendment, James Madison, a slaveholder himself, wrote that a militia is the best security of a free country. But after Henry, Mason, and others insisted that the amendment make it clear that southern states be able to preserve their slave patrol militias independent of the federal government, Madison changed the word country to state. So given that the Second Amendment was born out of a concern to protect the institution of slavery, do you think maybe it's time we stop using it to frame our ethical debates about gun laws? If we move our focus away from what the Constitution does or doesn't say, what the Founders had in mind or not, and started to look instead at the real-world consequences of gun laws, could it really be that bad?